Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We're going to give folks a few minutes to join in, and then uh, we'll start in about five minutes. Again, thanks everybody for joining in. We're gonna take just a few minutes to let everybody log on and then uh, we'll get started in about three minutes. Would you believe me now if I told you I got caught up in a wave? Almost gave it away. Would you hear me out if I told you I was terrified for days? Thought I was gonna break Oh, I couldn't stop it Tried to slow it all down Crying in the bathroom Had to figure it out With everyone around me Saying you must be so happy now Oh, keep preaching Then I'll keep going Right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We're going to get started. Uh, so uh, welcome to our second webinar of our outreach uh, remote work series. 
Uh, I'm Maria Giannopoulos. I'm joined here by my fabulous colleague, Andrea Holterman on the Civics Outreach team. And we have a special treat today. Uh, we're joined by Ashish Kelsey from the Trust and Safety team here at Google, uh, who's going to tell us all about online safety today. Um, if you have a question uh, or want us to clarify or want to know more, uh, make sure you ask right below. Uh, just hit the blue button and we'll be uh, taking questions at the end, but you can, uh, of course, upload them throughout. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ashish, uh, who is going to teach us all about online safety. Thank you so much, Maria. Hi, everyone. Super excited to be here. This is the first time I'm presenting, you know, conducting a workshop on online safety uh, from my home. So I'm super excited and thank you all for, for joining. Um, so today we'll be covering a few things on our agenda. So I know this is, this is an interesting time. A lot of us are, are working from home, maybe for the first time. So there are a few things that you need to sort of keep in mind when it comes to staying safe online. Um, for those of you who've been who've been comfortable and, and, and have actually been taking the precautions to stay safe online, you'd find that a lot of these tips are not very, uh, you know, different from what you would otherwise do uh, to, you know, make sure your data and your accounts are protected. But it's important that especially now when you're working from home, you do not have the comfort of, you know, the technical infrastructure or the security infrastructure that a lot of our uh, offices provide from a security infrastructure point of view. Uh, we're working from home. We might, you know, uh, might be sharing Wi-Fi. Uh, so it's important that we keep these things in mind. So, so to ensure that you know we have like a positive experience while we, you know, continue to work from home or or remotely wherever you are. So in today's workshop, uh, we'll be covering about five, four different things. So we'll start with protecting your accounts. Just take you through like the basics of of what you need to do to stay safe and and ensure that all your accounts are protected, especially your Google accounts. Uh, and then we talk a little about how do you protect your devices, your mobile phones, your, your laptops, your desktops. And then we talk a little about, you know, the web safety and what some of the things that you need to keep in mind when you're browsing the web and some of the tools and resources that are out there that can, you know, help you uh, as you try and ensure that, you know, uh, because everybody has a different need. So depending on your need, if you need like more security solutions or you need something easier, you want like different options out there. There are a bunch of tools and resources out there that we'd be sharing with you that you could sort of go through, go through at your own leisure and, and sort of pick and choose what works the best for you. So with that said, let's get started with the first part uh, of our training today, which is protecting your accounts. Now, this is something that's that's very critical. All of us have some sort of an on online account. It could be our, our email accounts. It could be a bank account, something that we're using uh, on the Internet. And it's important that, you know, we're securing these accounts because a lot of our, our personal data and, and uh, private information is out there. A lot of that is very sensitive. So we'll be talking about some of the things that you can do uh, when it comes to protecting your accounts so of things like passwords to verifications. Uh, there are some really uh, uh, useful tools for, for certain users who are, you know, particularly at risk, like the advanced protection and uh, will also run you through the security checkup that Google offers. Now, passwords. Now, I know this might seem quite obvious for a lot of you that, you know, we all use passwords and we know that, you know, I think from the time uh, we've been using the Internet, we've we've always been putting uh, our, our passwords every time we sign into an account. Now, whether we like it or not, the passwords are the first line of defense and you could have like a really strong uh, technical infrastructure. You could be part of a website that that has great security features, but if we use a password that's not very strong, that automatically puts your account and all the data at risk. So um, it's it's a very easy step, but it's a big part of online safety and it involves like very simple and smart uh, practices when it comes to creating strong passwords. I know a lot of websites already give you uh, information about what needs to go in to create a strong password, the length of the password, using special characters, uh, using you know alphanumeric keys, avoid using dictionary words. So it's important that you keep these uh, these steps in mind. And the reason I'm I'm, I'm sort of conveying this is uh, is here. So if you look at this list, I would give you like a second just just see some of the options that are available in this list. Now, these are unfortunately some of the most commonly used passwords. And, and this list has actually not changed a lot year on year. And when the, and this is an, it's an external agency that actually does an analysis. And every year when this list comes out, it looks pretty much the same with very minor changes. You might see like 
you know, maybe one, two, three, four, five, six is competing with password. But unfortunately, we still see that these are the most commonly used passwords. Now, imagine like if you have an account and you have one of these passwords, it's very likely that you know you your account and all the information in it might be compromised. So, if any of you who are who are joining us on the live stream, if you see your password on this list, please go and change it right away. Or if you have anything that looks remotely like this, or if it's simple, uh, if it's also you know it might be something that's personal to you, but might be publicly available, like uh, your your date of birth or or you know the date of birth of someone in your family, like your like your spouse or your or your kid. Uh, just make sure that you change that as well because it's not very uh, difficult to get that information uh, you know, from other places, maybe your social media or, or any other resource. So make sure that you keep these, uh, you know, these tips in mind when you're creating a strong password. Another very important thing, and I can't stress this enough, and this is based on you know, our, my experience of, of presenting this to a lot of different users across the world. A lot of users actually are very proud that they have a strong password. They say that it meets all the criteria that you've listed down, it's strong. But the biggest mistake that they do is that they use the same password across different uh, services. Now your passwords must be strong, but you must remember that you need to have a unique password for each of your accounts, especially for the critical accounts. So if, if you have, uh, and when I say critical, I'm, I'm talking about things like your email accounts, uh, your, your net banking accounts, and uh, you know you need to make sure that at least these critical accounts have uh, different passwords and they all have to be strong passwords now the reason this is ex essentially important uh, is that even if one of your accounts gets compromised you're essentially putting all your accounts at risk think of it as as you having like a super sophisticated you know a security system at your home uh, for for all your all your devices like for your home for your vehicle um, and for even for your office, but you have the same key that opens all of them. So if you lose your key, you're not just keeping your putting your house at rest, but everything that you own that requires the same key to open is at rest. So there's no point having a strong password if you're not using a unique password. So uh, it's really important that you keep this in mind. So, and if you if you already have like you know accounts where you have where you're using these passwords, I would highly recommend that you go ahead uh, and change them. Uh, you could also use something like a password manager because yes, I mean, let's admit it. It's not easy every time you need to create a new password. It's, I mean, I, I personally hate it and that's why I use a password manager. I use the one that's integrated with Chrome, uh, but you could use anything that you're comfortable with. Now, the advantage of password managers is that it creates the password for you. So it creates these long, you know, these really long, complicated strings that you could uh, directly use as your password. So they create these passwords for you and they also store and maintain them in an encrypted format. Um, make sure that you, you know, you're ensuring that the service, whatever password manager you use is, is a reliable one. You've done your research for using it, but that's definitely an easy way by which you could uh, remember your password. There are other tricks as well. Uh, there's no single or, or right way around here. So use and do whatever uh, suits for you. Like for example, a lot of people I know use passphrases instead of passwords, where you you know pick a sentence and and combine it together and make this nice long complicated password that only you remember, which is fine as well as long as you can remember it. But yeah, make sure that at the end of the day, whatever you're using, whether it's a password manager or if you're using a passphrase, that you are uh, actually making having a unique password for each of these critical accounts. Um, and also, um, I just wanted to sort of call out, as uh, Maria mentioned at the beginning of the workshop, if you have any questions, uh, please go and I'm sure you can see a box right below the screen where you can uh, enter your questions. So uh, just go and submit your questions and we'll take them at the end of the training. Thank you. Yep. Uh, now, the, another really critical thing that you could do in addition to, you know, having a strong password is actually setting up two-step verification. Now, this is extremely, extremely uh, important. So in fact, if, if there's one thing that I, I could like you to take away at the end of the session is, is two-step verification. Now, what two-step verification does is that it adds this additional layer of security to your account where it's combining something you know, which is your password, with something you have, which is a unique code that might actually come to you, uh, to your device in the form of a device prompt or uh, in the form of an OTP. So just so what this additional layer does is that even if somebody gets access to your password, if your account gets hacked and they have access to that password, they will not be able to log into your account. And when I say they, I mean the hacker or whoever's trying to get into your account, they will not be able to log into your account with, without the second layer of verification. Now, 
because these these OTPs are are either unique codes or they they have like a like a time they they expire after a set amount of time, it's very difficult for someone to actually brute force their way into your account. So uh, two-step verification extremely critical. In fact, you can take your uh, you know two-step verification to another level of security by using a security key. Now, security key is a, is, a, is a physical device that goes into the USB drive of your device. In fact, uh, many of them are NFC enabled, so you can use them with your mobile phones as well. So what this does is instead of using a code that comes to your device, you actually plug in the key or you or just uh, put it uh, towards the back of your NFC enabled phone and you can actually log in uh, using this. Now, since you know it's a physical device, there is no code, there is not, even if somebody it's really difficult, but if somebody is by is able to you know spoof into your your device, there's a SIM spoofing that's happened, and somebody gets access to your SMSs, uh, you're still secure because you need this physical device to actually log in. So security keys are a great, great uh, second layer for verification as well. Uh, in addition to that, and that's of course something that that's available for for all users. Uh, in, in fact, for your Google account, you can go to g.co slash two sp to set up two-step verification if you've not already done it. And if you've already done it, but you want to replace with uh, something that's that's even more secure, like you want to uh, set up a, a security key instead of a one uh, instead of an SMS, you can actually go and change what uh, your, your preferred default options are. So uh, make sure you give uh, go to this website. Also, it's not something that's specific just to your Google accounts. You can also go to uh, your banking websites or, or your other social media platforms a lot of uh, reputed websites already offer two-step verification. So wherever possible, just please go and, and uh, set this up. And also the, the good thing about the security key or even some of the third-party apps like the Google Authenticator app is that it, it works with third-party services as well. So you don't need a separate like you know device or a, or, a, or a different app for every single login. So I would highly, highly recommend this to everybody. Uh, another very, very cool thing that that Google offers, and this is one of our our most uh, you know the highest security level feature that we offer for for account security is our advanced protection program, and this is especially created for for users like you who who work for the government who handle with like a lot of sensitive data or or you know who are who are probably more prone to targeted attacks. So that is some, and that is why uh, we would highly recommend that you you check this out. The link to, for advanced protection is given below. It's g.co slash advanced protection. Now, um, what this does is it basically goes a little beyond the traditional traditional two-step verification that we just talked about, where uh, you know in two-step verification you have a choice where you could use a security key or you could use you know a one-time password uh, coming in the form of an SMS. But uh, for advanced protection, you have to have a physical security key in addition to your password to sign into your Google account. Now, um, we recommend that you at least have two security keys, one which has Bluetooth enabled and one which is a regular security key, like the one we showed in the picture. Um, you, can, you can check it. More information about the type of security keys is given on the website. So you uh, don't worry if this seems like too many details. Uh, you will find all this, all this information there. Uh, now, the main advantage of these two security keys is that even if you lose one security key, you always have a backup key so that you don't get locked out of your account. Now, this is something I would highly recommend if you as a user feel uh, you know, that your account is, is, is more susceptible to targeted attacks and you, know, you, you feel a little vulnerable with the existing security systems. So would highly recommend that uh, you know such users definitely go and check out advanced protection program and it's it's not you you're not contractually there's no contractual obligation where you have to stay enrolled you can always like sign out and and deactivate advanced protection if you don't think uh, you really need it uh, also we had uh, some really cool features that were announced not too long ago where we were letting users also use their you know uh, android devices uh, or the ios their apple phones uh, as an alternative to security keys. And uh, you'll find more information of that on the website. Uh, unfortunately, right now, because of uh, the situation that COVID-19, uh, you know, because of COVID-19, we're making some changes to how we protect the health of our workforce. So as a result, we have temporarily suspended the enrollment with your phone's built-in security, but we're hoping that this will be available shortly as well. So, so what that means is you can actually use advanced protection with just one security key and your mobile device instead of actually having two security keys. So that's that's a pretty cool feature as well. 
Um, in addition to that, Google also offers a security checkup. And this is something that I would, again, highly recommend uh, all of you try out. The, the URL uh, for, the web, for the website is given right here. It's g.co slash security checkup. Now, this is an, a very simple process that shouldn't take you more than two to five minutes. Uh, and to do, it takes you step by step through different uh, layers of security on your Google account. It identifies if any parts of your account are at risk. It shows you what are the different devices uh, that you've used to log into your account. Are you currently signed into any of those devices? What are the kind of security threats that have been detected on your on your system? Uh, you would also see some of these these uh, alerts come to your email directly, especially if you if you use a Gmail account. Uh, so all of those are are uh, listed down here. So you can take appropriate action if you see this. If everything looks fine, that's perfect. You don't really need to do anything. But if you see that there are some threats that have been identified, you can take appropriate action. Um, the recommendations are also given to you over there. So. If anything looks suspicious or unfamiliar, you can uh, edit the settings, change your password immediately, uh, and it takes just a few minutes. And you can do this as often as needed. I would recommend that you do this every three to six months because you know obviously uh, you're 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 doing a lot of things on your account, things are changing. So so just make sure that you you periodically go and do the security checkup. Now these are some of the best practices. Uh, from an account security point of view, of course, uh, you must remember that sec uh, security is, is a really, really big topic, and I can talk about this all day, But uh, these, and this is definitely by no means an exhaustive list, but again, these are some basic things, but critical things that you could do to protect your account. Similarly, we'll talk a few things that you can do uh, to protect your devices, especially today, uh, since you know a lot of us are, are at home, uh, Maybe we, you know, we have, uh, our families are there, and there are other people at home working as well. So it's it's very critical, especially for the users who work with sensitive data or information that you can't even show with your family or your roommates or anybody that you share your living space with. Uh, that you know you you are cognizant of that, and you change certain habits if you're not already doing them. Uh, one of the most critical things is actually using a screen lock. Now. When you're not using your computer, and this is this is across irrespective of which device, it could be your laptop, it could be a desktop, it could be your, your mobile phones, whichever device you're using, make sure that you have some sort of screen lock because um, especially your mobile devices or your laptops, you would have your emails locked in, you have a lot of sensitive data that's easily available. So, um, and if even if it's accidentally and if it's not intentional, if somebody gets access to that information, you might be putting your data or somebody else's data at risk. Uh, so please be cognizant of that. One of the simplest things that you can do for that is, is actually go uh, to the settings and automatically to set it to automatically lock whenever your device goes to sleep or after some period of time. So you don't have to, you know, you don't have to uh, consciously remember to, to lock your uh, screens or, you know, turn off your, uh, your mobile device every time you've turned to you, you, you used it. So uh, please make sure that you go check out the security settings available for your device. Uh, another very cool feature that uh, you should definitely use is enabling the Find My Device option for mobile phones. Now, in case you ever lose your phone, like for example, I know at least in the current situation, a lot of us are, are self-isolating and we are, we are at homes, but we might step out uh, to get groceries or from, for some uh, additional, uh, you know, other essential services that we might require. Now, this is true irrespective of this current situation or any other situation that that you know, setting enabling the Find My Phone device, and this is available again in the settings for for both Android and iPhone users, where you can actually find your phone in case you've lost it or you've forgotten it someplace. It gives you a lot of different uh, options as well. Like for example, it can allow you to remotely call your phone in case you're. In, it could even be somewhere in your apartment or your house, and you're not able to find it. It will call your phone. You have an option of locking it if it's not already locked. You can also set an emergency message. You can also go ahead and remotely delete that data. So even if you've lost your phone, at least you know that your data is secure. Uh, so would would highly recommend that, especially now since you're 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 in a shared space, that you're keeping some of these tips uh, in mind. Another very uh, critical feature, and I can't emphasize enough on this, is keeping your software updated. Um, I'm not sure about how the situation works for for all of you, but there are a lot of organizations that do not allow 
you know, or the laptops or the, or, the, or the physical computers to be taken back home, which means that a lot of users might be using their personal computers for, for official information. Or even if you're, you know, uh, using some other device, you need to make sure that uh, your software is updated, even for your official devices. Thankfully, when it's uh, for official devices, there is some degree of control that, that, you know, your system or IT administrator has. But especially for personal devices, make sure that, you know, you're keeping your software updated, especially your internet browser, your operating system, uh, whatever other software you're using. Now, the main reason for that is that a lot of these updates come with security patches. So if there are known vulnerabilities that, that you know, the these uh, organizations that that uh, run, that, you know, maintain your browsers or uh, once they identify certain vulnerabilities, they go ahead and, and uh, take action on them and they push them out in the form of software updates. Uh, so uh, this is something that, that you need to keep in mind. So whenever you get a chance, please make sure you go and, and update uh, your uh, software. Again, a simple thing that you can actually do is to turn on auto update so that you know you don't need to worry about it. Uh, whenever you're running the software, you you know that you're you're actually using the latest version of that software. Um, also, the other thing that you need to keep in mind is is besides updating your software that you have the right kind of software on your devices. Um, make sure that you're installing an antivirus software to protect your device. Some of these antivirus softwares are actually uh, really sophisticated. They come with with uh, additional features like firewalls, VPN, uh, parental controls. In case you know you have kids at home, that could be a really useful feature. It also they also come with password managers. So you have a lot of really useful tools available, uh, and you don't always have to pay for a good uh, you know software. Uh, you know you don't have to pay for a great antivirus software. A lot of them are free. Some of them come as a part of your operating system as well. But irrespective of what you use, based on your need, make sure that you have some sort of uh, you know, protection in place to uh, ensure that your device is free of uh, viruses and malware. Same goes for downloads as well. A lot of us, uh, you know, download applications. Make sure that, you know, you're always downloading them from, from trusted sources, especially on your mobile device. Make sure that it's only from, from iTunes for the Apple devices or Google Play for Android devices, or even if on, on you know, for your, for your uh, laptop or your, or your PCs, ensure that you're installing it from the official source. So that uh, because there's a lot of security checks and, and measures that are in place when, for these uh, softwares, even after they have uh, gone onto that store versus you downloading it from an unknown source. Now, the, the biggest challenge of downloading a software or a download, downloading an application that you don't know is that they might have malware or some kind of spamware, uh, which might put your data and your device at risk. So, so make sure that you have these uh, checks in place when you're downloading new applications or software. Uh, again, quick reminder that if you have any questions, please feel free to, to put that in, in the box that you see on your screen, and we'll take these questions towards the end. Uh, now we're moving on to the next part, which is again a very critical part, which is browsing the web uh, safely. Again, these are a few tips that that we can share. Uh, it's not exhaustive, but make sure that these are some of the things that, that you keep in mind, but you're also conscious of, of what's happening out there on the internet, so you are aware of the risk uh, and are not impacted by any of the challenges that are out there. Uh, a very important thing is, is choosing Wi-Fi networks. I know we are all fan of, of you know, free Wi-Fi, but you must remember that uh, a lot of public Wi-Fi is not secure. Now, the biggest difference between a secure and unsecure network is that the, the data transfer that actually happens might not be going, it may not be encrypted, which means that if there's anybody uh, who is on that network might get access or might be able to see the data transfer that's, that's, uh, that might be able to see the data that you're working on, which means that there's no guarantee of security when you're using a network that's unsecured. So, so if there was a hacker nearby and wanted to sort of Try and get access to your data. There's very little that you can that you can uh, do to stop them. Um, so you you know, thankfully now a lot of us are at home. Uh, so a lot of our our uh, routers and and the home Wi-Fi systems are are pretty secure. But in case you know you're you're trying to uh, you're having trouble with your Wi-Fi, please avoid first of all, of course, uh, hope, hoping that you're not going to any of the the public places and public Wi-Fi spots. But in case say you're able to get uh, public Wi-Fi access to your home, avoid using it, or even if you're using it, just be conscious that uh, to not do anything sensitive um, to that, you know, you're not actually uh, 
using that to log in or putting any financial information when you're connecting to uh, public Wi-Fi. Uh, one of the alternate solutions that you can actually use is using your, your mobile uh, internet where you can turn on a hotspot and use that because usually that is uh, secured. So, so those are some things that you can do. Uh, make sure that you're using secure network and you're not uh, using public Wi-Fi for, for you know, uh, sensitive content or like login or any kind of uh, uh, you know, financial transaction. Another thing that, um, again, um, assuming that some of you on this room, if not all, or whoever's you know, sort of uh, seeing this presentation right now would have seen the screen now, this is something that uh, you know the Google Safe Browsing team works, and this is information that we share with other browsers as well. Uh, you would see this on Chrome, Firefox, Safari, that if you attempt to visit a potentially malicious or a deceptive website, you would see this warning come up. These are browser warnings. You would not miss them. Uh, you have an option of actually like basically going ahead and visiting these websites, but uh, our recommendation obviously is to think twice before you do it because these are uh, this, these warnings come up when you know we've identified that the website might potentially be you know um, could potentially infect your device with the malware or it could be a phishing website. So if you see this, please avoid visiting these websites. There are situations where you might see this warning coming up on on good websites or websites that you trust and have visited in the past. Uh, you must remember that that uh, that might be the case because those potential web those websites might have potentially been hacked or 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 uh, you know there could be somebody else that's abusing that website to install malware. It need not mean that you know the the website owner or whoever manages that website is doing that intentionally. So so even if you see this on on good reputed websites uh, or on the side of caution, avoid using you know logging in because it could possibly impact your device. One of the other things that you can obviously do is, is uh, look at websites or use websites which have HTTPS. Now, if you look at this, this, uh, this analogy over here, think of HTTPS as, as a secured way in which you're, you're sending out your, your letters versus the one on the left, which is like a postcard with a message written right on it. Now, when you're, when you're uh, using an, a website with HTTP, the data is not uh, encrypted, which means anybody who gets access to that information uh, between, you know, when the information is going from your laptop to the to the server uh, of of the website, can can actually read that information. But versus, you know, when it's encrypted, even if they get access to your data, they cannot read your information. So, uh, especially, you know, when you're using websites like, you know, for e-commerce or for shopping or wherever you're putting your credit card details make sure that it's an HTTPS, uh, the website has HTTPS and uh, that way at least you know that your data is, is secure. But also remember that just because a website has HTTPS uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it is a, a genuine website. Uh, you might come across uh, an e-commerce website that has HTTPS, that's no way to know if it's a genuine e-commerce website or not. It's just sort of a technical signal whether your data is secure or not. So. So of course, do your due diligence, do your research before you shop on uh, any website uh, online. Another risk, and this is again something that that we see a lot, and this is a, a big threat. Uh, we're seeing a lot of this happening now with during uh, you know with the whole coronavirus situation as well. Is there's an increased uh, amount of phishing now? Phishing is a method where uh, you know. The people who try to abuse the system are trying to gather personal information using deceptive emails, websites, applications. Uh, so what they do is they essentially create a website that looks like some other website. Like, for example, it could be the Google login page. You might think it's the Google login page. You go put in your username and your password and you click on submit. But instead, you might actually uh, go and end up giving your, your, you know, your login details to somebody else. And phishing is extremely effective. So these numbers would give you a sense of you know, how impactful it is. So 91% of all information security attacks start with phishing. Um, these could be like, I mean, it seems very simple, but it's very, very effective. And that is why we, st we still see a lot of users uh, falling for phishing attacks. And 80% of attacks on businesses include phishing. Uh, in fact, even for users, uh, you know, from like such as you who uh, or from the government or have a lot, lot of you know sensitive information or uh, there could be users who might potentially be you know targeting you with a phishing attack they might 
uh, try to make it very realistic. They might try and use, you know, recent information and, and data, or they might even uh, try and use uh, personal connections, uh, names of your friends or people that you might possibly know as references and craft this message. We call this uh, social engineering attacks uh, where they might ask you for some information or ask you to, you know, uh, or you know, might tell that you know your your account is is about to be logged. So please give us your information right away. So here's an here's an example of what a phishing attack looks like. Right, like if you see this this email, uh, you can see that the URL is is from a completely different source. You can mouse over uh, the URL to see that it looks like you know your Google account uh, your URL, but it's completely uh, different. And uh, and on the right, you see that you know there's there's a there's a login page that looks like the Google login page, but it's actually a completely, uh, you know, the, if you see the URL, it's it's something else. And if you go put in your your username and password, it might actually end up going uh, to the, you know whoever's trying to abuse the system. So please be very careful. Um, some of the tips that that uh, you know you things that you need to keep in mind is avoid clicking on links from emails, especially if you do not trust them. Uh, you do not know who the sender is. Just make sure that. Uh, you know you're you're not clicking on those links if you get any kind of information from banks or official sources which say that you know your account's going to be locked down or you need to give this information right away uh, or on the side of caution call your bank reach out to somebody that you know there before you actually you know share any information um so so please be extremely uh, careful and cognizant of this um, so Chrome actually has has a has a new uh, sort of feature that's been integrated and uh, not too long ago, where if you enter a password uh, your your account a password on Chrome which has actually been compromised and it's available in you know the darknet or in one of the databases out there, we will uh, send give you a prompt. Uh, it'll give you an option of uh, to check your passwords and it'll give you a prompt of. of of you know changing your password so this way at least you know that you know uh, is is any of has any of your username or password actually been compromised so this is a a, a feature that's integrated into google's uh, chrome's password manager uh, and this is now in integrated into the chrome browser itself if you're more if you're curious about about phishing and and you know you want to see what some of the phishing websites look like you want to you know just try out uh, I would highly recommend that you check out this uh, the phishing quiz. Uh, so this is available at g.co slash phishing quiz. This is extremely interesting. There are some really nice examples out there. Uh, they're very realistic. Uh, I admit that when I took it for the first time, I actually fell prey to one or two uh, situations because they look so realistic. Uh, so so it will give you an example, it'll show you many examples of, you know, phishing emails and how do you spot it. There are also like uh, tips and, and tricks on what you can do when you come across a phishing email. So would highly recommend and encourage that you all sort of uh, take this at some point. All right, uh, now we're moving on towards the last part of our presentation, which is around, you know, tips and resources to, to stay safe. Um, so one of the things, especially if if you're using Google Drive or in fact if you're using any kind of you know uh, document sharing services, I know since you know we're we're all remote, uh, we're working remotely, we're using a lot more of these you know uh, services. Uh, Google Drive, especially something I use a lot. There are a lot of features that are available uh, within the settings, especially the sharing settings. Please make sure that you're looking at what are some of these options available. Uh, especially if I can give you some of the examples available on, on Google Drive, you can see who has access to, to the link. Uh, even for people, when you give them access, right, you want to think about what kind of access do you want to give them? Do you want to give them edit rights? Do you want them to uh, you know, just be able to comment on the content or just view the content? You can also set an expiry. For example, if you want somebody to have access to a doc just for a week or just a month, you can set that uh, within the email because there's a high possibility that you might forget to go back and revoke the access. So you can actually set the expiry. Uh, you can also set other settings like who can copy this, this document, who can print it, can somebody download this document. So you can lock uh, some of those settings uh, on your document as well so that you know, you're making sure that only the right people uh, have access to that doc. You have a lot of these features available for your emails as well today. So make sure that you're, you know, you're able to, to use them uh, as well. The another uh, useful tool that you could use is a virtual private network uh, or uh, the VPN as it's popularly called. 
Now, these services, it makes it very hard for others on your network to see what you do online. Uh, do online. It gives you that extreme, uh, that enhanced sense of uh, privacy. Um, it, I mean, especially if you're working on your very sensitive information, it can also sort of obscure your location. People can't track you or know where you are uh, using that information from. So uh, if, if it means being able to sort of access websites or services that might be blocked in some other countries or some other parts, uh, you would still be able to do that. And of course, because it's, it's encrypted, it keeps your communication private now. That's, those are some really useful features of VPN, and that's why almost every corporate network uh, requires their employees to, you know, have some sort of VPN enabled. Uh, but especially if you're thinking of setting up VPN, uh, one word of caution is is make sure that you do your research before choosing a VPN service because there are a lot available in the market. Um, especially there are many free VPN services available. Just make sure that you're aware of how these VPN, these free VPN services work, uh, because you must also understand that all free VPNs. Even though they say they're free, they need to make money some way. So if they're looking to make money, uh, will you, you need to ensure that you know they're not selling the data they collect about you or the sites you visit, uh, or you know if it's if it's actually a fake website that's that's you know uh, fronting as as a VPN provider uh, might just actually uh, install some sort of malware which might steal your personal data. So so be very careful. Do your research. There are lots of you know trusted security websites that review VPN services and give you recommendations. Um, so, so make sure that you do that, and uh, you also need to remember that it's not an end-to-end -end solution to to protect you from malware or other attempts like phishing. It it kind of allows you to use have like an encrypted network, but it's not sort of like the uh, it's not like a complete solution for all your threats on the internet. So, so make sure that you understand what a VPN offers, but you continue to sort of have use some of the other recommendations as well. Um, we have really useful resources on on this website. I would highly recommend that you you check this out, uh, securityplanner.org. So this is something that a lot of industry partners have come together. It's Google, Microsoft, a lot of other industry leaders have come together and uh, created this resource for for everybody. And it it essentially asks you for i mean it, it provides information across different uh, services it is why you don't have to be a google account user specifically uh, it gives you tips and and ways by which you can protect all kinds of devices whether it's a mac device or a windows device or an android phone or uh, irrespective of what kind of device what kind of service depending on your need whether you are willing to pay whether you want free service whatever you need you have sort of like a customizable solution that you can get from here um, another thing that that Google has made again, this is very specific from from an election security point of view, is we have this website uh, at g.co slash protect your elections. Now it's a free suite uh, which has like tools for for candidates, campaigns, publishers, uh, which help you sort of protect against digital attacks and provide like reliable information. So we have some really useful tools and services uh, out there as well, and of course. We have uh, some additional resources on safety.google. Yes, that's that's a real URL. It's not that I've forgotten to add a .com. This is the URL. Uh, please make sure you go to safety.google. This has some really interesting uh, uh, information. This has information on how you can keep yourself safe, your family safe, uh, you know, general tips and guidance for all kinds of users. So this is sort of like uh, our repository of all safety-related guidance, irrespective of whether you're a Google user or not. And uh, that brings me to the end of our workshop. So if you have any questions, uh, please, uh, if you haven't already sort of send them, please send them right now. And uh, Maria is going to help me with the questions so, so I can take them. And of course, if you ever need to reach out to the team, the alias is civics-outreach at google.com. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Ashish. That was an amazing presentation. I know every single time uh, you give one of these presentations, I learn a little bit more myself. So um, we're so lucky to have you. And, um, uh, you know, we really want to make sure that everybody kind of knows these tips and tricks. Uh, so just a, a first question for you. Um, you know, a lot of organizations have shared Google accounts uh, to uh, administer their YouTube channels, uh, things like that. How do you recommend uh, securing something that's shared between people? Um, I think one really useful uh, way would be to have an additional uh, sort of uh, two-step verification as we talked about. So so 
there is a possibility for a particular google account to have multiple uh, you know security keys registered so even if it means that you have like three or four or five or, or it's a much larger team that's that's accessing a google account you you have like a shared uh, uh, sort of the, the second layer of verification is shared amongst everybody so that at least you know that you're able to 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 log in in a secure way versus just like giving out your password to to a bunch of different people so that's that's definitely but again um, another really useful way of doing it is if if not everybody actually needs access to that to that uh, account you could uh, make use of a lot of the 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 tools and services like for example uh, you could do a lot of collaboration on drive and some of the other resources out there without actually having to share uh, your account details so lots of lots of tools and ways depending on your need that you can use it amazing i i think that's helpful to a lot of the civic organizations out there um we we all know there's um, many people who need a access to different things so that's super helpful uh and just getting that out there uh ashish uh what's the most creative password you've ever uh seen Oh, question. That that's an interesting one. Um, I've I've seen I've come across a lot of cases where you know uh, I, I'm not sure about about passwords, but at least if you remember the the pattern locks that we used to have on on a lot of the Android devices, where you could sort of create a pattern, where a lot of them for some reason would just have L. Uh, and I realized that while doing my trainings, and whenever I would go to one of these trainings, I would just put that up and ask people in the audience if if that's actually their their screen lock password. And I think seven or eight out of ten times there would be somebody in the audience who would actually have that as a password. So so they were they were freaked out, but I was happy that it worked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you hate to see those common passwords, but. Uh, I know uh, a lot of people have um, things easy that they can remember. Um, so we have a question here from Allison. Um, so she asks, my coworker was recently put on a waiting list to enroll in APP. When will we be allowed to enroll again? Uh, Andrea, I think um, you have uh, some information on this. Yeah, thanks, Maria. Um, if you have a physical security key, you should actually be able to start enrolling tomorrow. Um, if you're referring to the um, phone as a security key, um, that's going to be a bit longer of a wait. Um, but if you have any specific questions around that um, and want to talk a little bit more about that wait, um, I would very much encourage you to email us at civics-outreach at Google, um, and we can talk a little bit more about that. Awesome, awesome. And, and if I can, if I can just add, uh, I think in the meantime, I would highly encourage that you at least set up your two-step verification with the security key if you've not done that, uh, while you wait for you know the advanced protection enrollment to happen. Awesome. And of course, with that question and any other questions that you have, uh, make sure to ping civics outreach at google.com. Uh, for any questions that you may have uh, security related or otherwise, um, we are happy to help. Uh, that's that's our team right here. So uh, of course, if there aren't any more questions, which I don't think I see any more here, um, we'll wrap up today's uh, session. Uh, our next webinar will be Monday, March 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, that will be about four ways Google can help you uh, pivot to virtual uh, when you're working remote. So make sure to tune in 1 p.m. Eastern on Monday the 30th, and we'll see you then. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.